Yes. Can you can we talk about um, your views, all your views, on the position of fundamentalism, if I can use that word, inside Islam, and to take what Jonathan said a stage further, because I think it's a very fair point. What, how is it regarded? I, I have a problem with the word. It's a, it's a 19th century word that was used to describe reformist movements within, within Protestant Christianity. Uh, in Islam, f fundamentalism, uh, the, the word in Arabic is actually a very, a very high word. Uh, it, it has to do with building based on sound fundamentals or principles. Uh, extremism, however, is, is, a, is a word I think that is more useful. Um, the, the, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, said, beware of extremism. The Quran actually says uh, to the Christians and the Jews, do not go to extremes in your religion. So it's, the Quran actually tells Jews and Christians not to go to extremes. So it becomes troublesome when there are Muslims uh, who their own book tells other religions not to be extremists when they begin uh, to become extremists. So I think that extremism is the problem. It's a human problem. I think that it exists. Uh, it's a human tendency. Extreme circumstances breed extremism, as in Nazi Germany. Uh, but I think that in terms of, of the theology of it, there is a crisis in Islam right now, which is the how do we legitimize uh, religious authority. Uh, this was not a problem a hundred years ago because the institutions for legitimizing authority were still very much in intact. They were literally dismantled by the colonial enterprise. I think there's also there's a, a political edge to this as well. I mean, one of the things happened in 1924, the Khalifa was abolished by Mustafa Kemal. Can you just explain what that means? The Khalifa was basically the um, authorized political leadership of the Muslim world, or it claimed to be that anyway, and it was more or less recognized. So there was a template for Muslims at what kind of political authority they should be, and that was to live under a Khalifa. And then you could, you could worry about whether it was a good or a bad Khalifa, but that was more or less the template. Now, with the abolition of that, you suddenly have an explosion of political theory. How should Muslims live? And what kind of political arrangements are necessary for Muslims? And that is what you're seeing is actually the politicization of those questions. And that's why, why I accept exactly what Hamza is saying about the, um, the theological influences, but there's also a political imperative that for Muslims, how to live, like any other society, how to live in a good society. What is the idea of a good society? When you no longer have a sanctified answer to that, you then start having attempts to try and construct this. This is why, for example, the movements, all of these movements that people call fundamentalists, what they really want is an Islamic order. Now, what that actually means in practice varies greatly from place to place. And why people actually, uh, uh, to some extent, follow them, because for them, Islamic order simply means a just order or good governance. Now, it's the practice of putting that there, putting it into place, which becomes very, very complicated. This strikes me as very interesting, because it seems to me there may be an answer here to my earlier question. Because if, there, if one of the problems which both of you are describing in, is a, in the Muslim world is an absence of an accepted authority system of a, of a kind that I would understand in the Christian world, for yes. example, then maybe the individuals you named are able to fire off these fatwas, but they're not universally accepted in the way that I would understand maybe applying a kind of more sure. formal hierarchical model from, me, from some of the other of the world's great religions. It, but it, it seems exists, to me, that it, it, it seems to me this might be a wider problem for Islam, that it's it doesn't a have a lead, there's a leadership vacuum, is, yes. is in a way what you're no, describing. No, this is a major problem. Another aspect that a lot of people aren't aware of is that traditionally in the Muslim world, the best intellects went to Islamic studies and theology just as in the West. Now, we still have quite significant uh, training, theological training in the West here. I mean, we, we have some very serious Christian thinkers still. However, in the Muslim world, the vast majority of, of intellects now go to medicine, go to, to engineering, and, and these type of elements. It is the result of that, that the kind of collective ostracism of terrorism, Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden, that I, in a way, and I think a lot of people in the West are looking for, is actually impossible to ask for from the Muslim world. Well, there's no security of the Muslim world. I mean, firstly, there, even if you had, I mean, why isn't there a Muslim unified speaker? You assume that if there was a Muslim leadership, it would be a leadership that actually would collaborate and would actually be able to like cooperate. Papacy, yeah. Is it just a, yeah. a crude analogy, but, like a paper? But there's not but any the last papacy, time there was... I think, yeah. I, no, I, I, mean, I wouldn't ask for an individual, Even though there wasn't collective. a priesthood... The last time there was a there, de facto... Yeah. There, there was, last time there was a de facto leadership, in a sense, was um, Ayatollah Khomeini. And the problem here was this. And he certainly had his supporters outside the Shia circles. So the problem here comes down to it is this. Is it possible to imagine a 
leadership of the Muslim world, which will be recognized as a leadership of the Muslim world by non-Muslims, which can also be anti-Western, for example, can say, well, actually, we don't agree with the foreign policies and things like that. And these are the kind of complicating issues that you can't keep removing this question simply to instances of what the texts say, or what happens in theology. These are actually political questions which are politically founded well, I agree in the with that world. too, but I'm afraid it's one of the other things I've sort of picked up in just conversations I've had. The sense I'm getting is a lot of clerics or theologians or students of this would make a theological judgment similar to the one you made, which is that it's a gross distortion, etc., but feel frightened for political reasons of saying that because they do not want to be on the wrong side of what is a growing trend, particularly among the young of the Arab and Muslim world, and they do not want to, want to be less radical than the man who is now the current champion of this movement. Okay, we'll, we'll be back in... Uh...